2007. I have a fan club. Graduated uh, residency in 2012. Um, and before we go on with the rest of our program, uh, I want to welcome you back and also let you know that when the program is ended today, please don't forget to pick up your copy of Melinda Gates' book, The Moment of Lift, How Empowering Women Changes the World. Um, it's it's going to be outside right at the registration desk. In it, Melinda Gates talks about the importance of empowering women because empowering women, when you lift up a woman, you lift up humanity. There's also some recent news that she just committed $1 billion to gender equality to expanding women's power and influence in the United States. There is also an excellent article out there um, from the Smithsonian Magazine. It's called Sidelined, and it uh, talks about a researcher's um, the products of her research that talks about the history of the systematic way in which the field of sciences um, concealed the presence and contributions of women. So I really hope you pick that article up when you get the book. Both of these will be outside and they're really, they're, they're good reads. Before we start, I'd also like to take just a minute to acknowledge the SMAA Women in Medicine and Science Committee. Committee members, if you could please stand up. Thank you so much. Thank you for putting this inspirational event together. Now it is my honor and pleasure to introduce our afternoon keynote speaker, Dr. Phyllis Gardner. A tenured professor of medicine at Stanford School of Medicine, Dr. Gardner's expertise is in medicine, pharmacology, and drug delivery systems, as well as corporate investing and governance. From professor to vice president of research at a drug delivery company to venture capitalist, her path has been a singular one traversing the worlds of academics, research, and development, and industry. Through it all, she has been a fierce advocate for her students and for women in industry. Dr. Phyllis Gardner, like a salmon swimming upstream. A serving salmon. <laughs> so good. I'm a good following some of them. So I'm going to make a couple of confessions. First, I have had no idea why Marsha wanted me to speak. And I was really worried about what am I supposed to say. Secondly, my mother died a few days ago. And we flew her up from Texas because she wanted to be buried by my father. And that happened yesterday. So the entire week, I was mostly thinking about that, including learning the words to Jesus, Save Your Pilot Me, because that was her favorite song. And it turns out, I asked the minister uh, who officiated, I have an odd request, I said. Can I sing this song? And she said, Oh, you won't believe it, but your brother asked the same thing. He lives in Texas. So the two of us did a duet, shakily, but we did it. <laughs> and uh, so if I burst out into Jesus Save Your Pilot Me, you'll understand. Um, you heard a little about what I've done. I want to start with where I came from. My parents, because I've been contemplative all week, my mother, my father, is a direct descendant of uh, somebody who fought in the Revolutionary War. Uh, and I can absolutely go through the entire history because after James Gardner finished the war, he moved to Virginia, where, it, as we, I very grandiosely said as a child, he got a grant of land from the king. Well, I, I doubt that. It was from the king, exactly. But he got a, a plot of land in Hillsville, Virginia, and the whole Gardner family were independent farmers. And there were only four generations above my father. Uh, there was James, then Abraham, then Isaac, then Noah, and then my father, Frank. He was one of seven children, five of whom went through college and on, and were all teachers of some sort, professors or teachers. He uh, that was not a wealthy family by any stretch. 
So he went to Berea College in Kentucky where you work your way through. It's for Appalachian kids. Now my mother, and I only learned a year ago that her father was a coal miner in Kentucky. Morrill County, Kentucky, John Van Winkle. And the Van Winkles, it turns out, came to the United States, a whole group of them, and lived in Hudson Valley, New York's, as in Rip Van Winkle, uh, for years until a group of them moved to Kentucky. So you'll find most Van Winkles in New York or Kentucky. And my mother was the fourth child of John's first marriage. Her mother was Mamie Rose from Ohio. And her father, uh, her mother died when she was an infant. So her father turned her over to his mother for care. And she was essentially an orphan. Uh, after eight years or so, Sarah Van Winkle sent her to the Rose family in Ohio. And you may know one of her relatives, Pete Rose. And, you, and Pete Rose, as you know, had a gambling problem. And the Roses were rather dissolute. They were drinkers, womanizers, etc. Which probably made my mother the way she was in the end of her life, oh, through her life, a major teetotaler, a total Christian and a believer. She turned away from that life. So, but she wanted to go to high school in Hamilton, Ohio. But my, her uncle Harvey, who was the only one who didn't drink, but he ran um, a car dealership in Hamilton, Ohio. And he, he did love fast cars. And I do remember going with him once when I was a child in the early 50s and scared to death because he went so fast on the highway. I'll never forget it. He was the first place I ever saw TV. So he was a little bit racy, but he didn't want to have her in high school in his house. So he sent her to Berea College where you can also work your way through high school. So she met my father there. Now my father was very handsome, tall, dark, and handsome. And she was pretty. And they met, I think, in the bakery shop where they were working, or maybe the laundry room, I can't remember. But anyway, after he graduated from his freshman year, he, he, he volunteered for the Army because it was World War II. So he went off, and my mother, he was called off to Little Rock, Arkansas, and my mother apparently graduated. There's a little doubt about what age she really was, but we won't go into that. <laughs> she said she was 18, but she may have been 16. She took a train to Little Rock, Arkansas, and eloped with my father. She followed him all around the South as he went from camp. He was, a, he was an instructor, um, drill instructor, because he was tall. And then um, they were at Camp Land, and she always got a job. All the other wives were looking for jobs, and she somehow always got a good job. And they would live together in you know, boarding houses. Uh, not my father, she, he lived on base, but she was in a boarding house. And then in Camp Landing, he was shipped out at night, and t two battalions went out from Camp Landing of the infantry to the European theater. And one sunk, and she did not know for months whether he'd survived. I mean, he didn't have smartphones and tweets, etc. And my father said he landed. They, ha they said, drop your backpack, we'll bring it to you. And he didn't see a toothbrush or anything for six months. So they had a hard scrabble start, both of them, in that sense. But when he came back, he had the uh, v GI Bill. VP he went to Virginia Tech, v Virginia Polytech at the time, now it's Virginia Tech. And they had my brother. They lived in a trailer. And he got his undergraduate degree. And then he went to Iowa State. And he got his PhD. And he got it in agronomy, which is crops and soils. And he proceeded to uh, rise quickly in the academic ladder. He was a really bright guy. And so he went to a University of Georgia as an assistant professor. Then he went to Ohio State as an associate professor. I was born at, in Ames when he was getting his PhD. So by the time I was five and a half, I was back in Ames, Iowa State, because he was a full professor. I, that's pretty fast. So he, there, my sister was born, and we had this idyllic 
life in Ames, Iowa. Uh, I didn't go back for 40 years, but I went back when we took our son to Grinnell and to, to look at Grinnell. And we stopped, and they were going up to McAllister, and we drove through it. And I swear I remembered everything. It had not changed one bit. And it was just su such a sweet place. And then he was supposed to he would go with AID to Uruguay. And we were going to live in Montevideo. But then he got offered department chair and head of extension in Stillwater, Oklahoma, Oklahoma State University. So kicking and screaming, we all were dragged down to Oklahoma State University. And uh, of course, I grew to like it. I had fun. But I was a smart kid. Uh, you know, I, they, gave, they had a fellow. I was miserable whenever I was standing out like that. I tried to play dumb as much as I could because, you know, and Oklahoma had football and the cheerleading squad were the big thing. So, um, you know, that was a bit hard for me. I know that if I'd grown up in New York, I would not have been trying to play dumb, but, you know, it was Oklahoma. And I, my, then my parents moved for my father to be a dean, and I, right the day after I graduated, and then I went to University of Illinois undergrad. And that's a very good school. And if I hadn't, because my parents believed in state schools, I would have gone to Oklahoma State, and I wouldn't have had the opportunities I had from the University of Illinois, because I was the second person in the University of Illinois to ever be admitted to Harvard Medical School, because they, and it's a great school. It was a lot harder at University of Illinois than Harvard Med. So, but, you know, so I had gone on an archaeology dig. That was a great moment. We were in Beersheba. We were digging up the Tel Beersheba. And if you know Tels, they're city piled upon city, piled upon city. They're sacred spots. And they cut a pie-shaped wedge. And we were going for the Israelite layer. And the Roman layer was 2,000 years old. The Israelite layer was 3,000 years old. And there was a Roman castle on top. And we had to dig through that Roman castle because ah, it's, too, it's not old enough. So we went. And we, it, was, it was an amazing experience. And I was with the uh, American Zionist Youth Foundation. And of course, I wasn't a Zionist Jew. Uh, my husband's Jewish, but I was not. And they, it was my first taste of true discrimination. They, you know, I was not, I was a shiksa. And, because the, these were Zionists, except for my friend from University of Illinois, most of them were very strong Zionists. And they didn't, they weren't so appreciative of the shiksa coming along, but it was a learning experience and it was an amazing experience. And then I went to universe, I mean to Harvard Med, and I felt like my ship had come home. I loved it. I just loved it. I lived in Vanderbilt Hall, and I just I loved my friends. I I was I blossomed there because I just felt this is where I belong. And consequently, I'm now very involved in Harvard Med School because I just I bonded, imprinted like a duck. Same time I imprinted on the Red Sox. And it was just a really wonderful time for me. Uh, and my daughter went there too. So we were one of eight mother-daughter pairs. And uh, she's graduated. But anyway, so after that, I trained at Mass General Hospital. And it was tough, those years of training. And you started out as an intern on call by yourself. And I remember my resident telling me that the first, his, his first day as an intern, he was, he was taking, we had, in Mass General, they have the old, old bullfinch, which is where the ether dome is, where the first ether. And in, uh, there is a coronary care unit, and you had to take an elevator up to get there. <laughs> and there was an elevator operator, and he'd had a lobotomy. So he, apparently, Ellis Reinhertz, he was an intern, and he was taking a patient up to the CCU in the elevator when the patient coded and the elevator got stuck. So he walked out, and the chief of medicine persuaded him to come back. So he tells me this story, and I'm like, oh, dear. And it truly was trial by fire. Um, but OK, two years of that, working hard, and I was going to go to NIH. 
And that's a typical route uh, at the time. So I was going to go to NIH. But I had a year in between because, well, because I was going to NIH, I would be specializing in cardiology. And in those days, you could take that third year and do something else. So I was, OK. So I'm looking, and I get offered chief resident of the American Hospital in Paris. Well, cool. And then I get off, I thought about going to the Indian Reservation and, uh, and, and something rock, Arizona. It was a Navajo reservation. And then I was asked by Stanford to come out and be a senior resident. And if, I was really torn. Oh, and also a thing in England. I was torn, but then the chief of medicine said to me, well, if you want to be in academic medicine, you'll go to Stanford. And being a person who's influenceable at the time, I did. And then Stanford really socked it to the Harvard MGH girl. They had just instituted a policy where you were on call two nights out of three. And you were the primary person. And I had just gone through two really tough years. The tough year here was senior residency, unbeknownst to me. I did one month of two nights out of three. And, then, and if all of you who have had night call know, this is really hard. And if you do it two nights, you are sick. So I uh, finally said, this is not possible. So they switched it huh, after me. So anyway, um, I spent two years here. Now, just before <laughs> my senior, I mean, in my uh, medical school years, I got engaged to my six foot six German Olympic uh, athlete, swimmer classmate. And I really thought I was deeply in love with him. And so I came out here, and we separate, you know, it was a separation for a year. And then <laughs> I got, for the first 12 days, I got letters saying, I love you madly, I love you dearly and then nothing. So I called him up, and he said, I can't talk now. And then he said, he called back, and he said, I had a woman here. I went, oh. Well, that was it. Uh, you can imagine, I'm out here working two nights out of three by myself in California. I have just been royally dumped, and I am dying. Um, and I had a chief resident. There are two chief residents at a time, and my chief resident, I was warned about, do he, you make friends with him, but do not go out with him. He has, well, never say something like that to me, the salmon swimming upstream. So yes, we started a relationship, and OK, in the end, I changed all my plans. I ended up going to New York, being there after my senior, uh, after, oh, I did a chief residency, after my chief residency, I followed in his footsteps. Then I went to New York, and we, uh, and then two years later, I had seen ion channel biophysics. I had seen patch clamp recording. It was new, and there were only two labs in the world doing it. And I remember so distinctly, I got an acceptance at one of the labs, David Cahoon's lab in University College London. And I remember swimming at the UN Plaza Health Club, because I would come home from Columbia Med down. My, Fellowship was at Columbia Medical School. And I popped my head out and said, we're going to England. And my husband's like, oh my god. Because he was an MD, PhD. And then he'd already done a fellowship. And so here, here I was. But boy, were those two good years in my life. I loved it. First of all, I was very excited to be in the forefront. Uh, Bert Sockman, uh, who along with Erwin Nair, won a Nobel Prize for patch clamping, came to our lab all the time because David Cahoon could analyze it all. So, then Stanford, we, we were looking for faculty jobs from England, which is not ideal. And uh, we were, we've, I had jobs in Boston. He had jobs in New York. The only places we had mutual job offers were University of Iowa and Stanford. We came to Stanford. And that was a tough one, because the person, or the chief of medicine who'd offer su our, us the jobs had just been fired for plagiarizing an entire chapter of a book. Why anybody in their right mind? He had taken a chapter from William's textbook of endocrinology and put it in Good Gilman's textbook of pharmacology. Word for word, 
and no one noticed. And trust me, I read both of those chapters. Nobody noticed until the author, the original author, went to see what Goodman and Gelman was saying about his subject and saw his work unattributed. So we went, we arrive in Stanford, and we're staying with this chief of medicine and his family. And the world is blown apart, and everybody's a little bit, you know, it's not good that you're the person who hired you. <laughs> so so I was been, I've been on the faculty since 1984. Now, I wrote, I, entitled this like a salmon swimming upstream. And I think I did that because I've always thought it was the perfect analogy for women in science. I hate to say it, but salmon go home, as you know, every four years or so, and they spawn, and then they die. But there's a, there's a picture I don't mean that we're going to die. I didn't mean that. Um, but there's a picture. Uh, sometimes you see those floating pictures, at least on the back, of things of geography and that. I mean, geographical sites. And there's one where there's a bear, and you see a salmon hopping into its mouth. And it's it's that it's probably taking place in the Brooks River, which is in Brooks uh, Par uh, National Park in Alaska. And there's a well-known spot there where there's about a four-foot waterfall, not so high that the salmon who are battling their way up can't hop it. But sometimes, often, the bears sit there and wait till the salmon jumps right into their mouth. It's a good spot for photographing bears. So to me, and I think about those fish ladders around dams and all that, and I will tell you, I don't think it's easy. I, I, my daughter now is a resident in OBGYN at the Harvard Hospital, at her partners, uh, MGH and Brigham, and she is working so hard. And I've seen, I've seen, you know, she thought it would, it's different now. But I think it's hard. And you, you've got barriers all of the way. And, but you just keep struggling, and you just keep struggling, and you keep struggling, and you sort of wonder, where am I going? What am I doing? Uh, but I thought, don't say that, Phyllis. You'll sound whiny. I'm not whiny. I'll continue. So I joined Stanford. And in, uh, I got tenure in 82. And I was eligible for sabbatical. And I couldn't go anywhere. I'd had two kids getting tenure, my daughter and my son. And I wrote grants, and if you wrote grants, during, you know, I had a laboratory. And if you wrote grants with two children, when do you think you wrote them? You'd get up at 3 in the morning, and you'd write grants, because you couldn't do it during the day. I was attending on the wards, et cetera. And when I had my daughter, I had two weeks off. And I had to pay it back. Uh, and I was attending on cardiology and had to be there at 7 in the morning. Now you if you can only imagine having a baby, and being at work dressed and copacetic at 7 in the morning, two weeks after having a baby, that's rough. But you know, that was, a, that was one of those fish ladders. And by the time I had my son two years later, uh, it was, it, it, I got six weeks off. It was, seemed heavenly. Of course, I still worked. I went into work, but I could go in in shorts, et cetera. And, so those were really tough years. But I, I did it. I just kept pushing and getting grants and going on grant review boards, et cetera. Uh, I was with NIH. I was served on CBY2 for five years. I was on the American Heart Association study section for seven. And I just, and those, those are hard days too, because everyone who's done grant reviews knows that you sit with, a, in the old days, a box filled with stacks of paper that you have to go through. And you're trying to write your own grants, and you're trying to take care of your kids, and all that. My savior was uh, my, my parents uh, and my husband. Oh, my husband's fantastic. He does all the cooking. <laughs> um, and he's also incredibly handy and everything else. And that really helps. That is the biggest help if you have a partner and then I had had two 
nannies and two au pairs. And the nannies came from Mothers Indeed, which was a highly regarded agency. My first nanny, or so-called nanny, was uh, leaving my daughter as an infant alone and going walking. And finally, the neighbors told me. And so we could find her, and she said, oh, I was taking the Fisher Price monitor. I was sure I could hear her. Uh, no, it goes about, you know, 10 feet. So we gave her one more chance. Why I did that, I don't know. But she continued to do it. So of course, we had to get rid of her. Then I had a Swedish au pair, and she was lovely, except for she was dreadfully homesick. She wanted a Volvo because, you know, she safe. <laughs> So we got a Volvo, and of course she had two wrecks, and <laughs> she was so homesick. But I would get, we'd, by this time we were, we were in Peter Coots, and I would get home, and she'd be doing leg lifts with my daughter up in the balcony. <laughs> and she was funny, and, but she was homesick to be, oh. So we said, bring your boyfriend over, Kleba. He was from Norway. And he was fantastic with the kids. But you know, it's nine months, you get to have to get another one. So I got another au pair from Sweden, Ann Knudsen. Oh, was she good at organizing. And she reorganized everything. Our dancer built shelves, complained that her, the laundry didn't get hot enough and things weren't white enough and all of that. And, but she didn't like toddlers, and my daughter was too, and she was a willful too. So she was slapping her in public and things like that. So I had to have a grandmother, my husband's mother or my mother here almost all the time besides her. So then I go back to the nannies. And I get to Mothers Indeed. And my first, uh, no, the, the one I hired was a beautiful, she was wonderful, Antonia. She was a beautiful little thing. I say little because she was petite. She had a dog, so we interviewed the dog. And because uh, she was going to bring the dog, and she, at that time we were in another house than we are now with a garage room, bedroom and bath. So she was there, and she arrived, and suddenly her little crisp blue suit was turned into Birkenstocks and beads and every flowy things. Okay. And then that weekend, her estranged husband arrived in a Volkswagen van, and there's a distinct Air, uh, smell in the air, and all right then. But she was lovely with the kids, just terrific. So, you know, okay. She would bring down her friends from Oregon who were on welfare, and <laughs> I'd come home to a house filled with these mothers and their babies. Um, but then she started eating a lot. I mean, and we thought, well, I'm used to, well, I was used to that. Au pairs always gain 20 pounds. And no, seriously, my daughter-in-law was an au pair. She is skinny and beautiful as you can come. But when my son first met her, she was 20 pounds heavier. And that's so common because they're not used to American food, and it's also other people's money, and they're lonely, and they just tend to overeat. And so anyway, Antonia was doing this, and I was just really worried. And then... We were having a dinner party, and she came to the door, and she said, I need some help. She said, I have mites. And my husband, very calm, he said, that's OK. We'll take you to the pediatrician, I mean the kids, and you, and we'll get it treated. She said, well, I can't be treated. I'm pregnant. And I went, oh, that's why you gained weight. <laughs> so she was only there seven months. Now, what saved me was my father retired from University of Florida in Gainesville where he'd ended up as a professor. And they came, and they took care of my kids. And it was just fantastic. So consequently, now I am helping my daughter, uh, my husband and I. We're, alternate, we're still working. We're alternating with the Canadian grandparents. Uh, they do six weeks to our three, because we kiss, you know. And we go to Boston. We've rented a place there and we take care of our two-year-old grandson, and that is a humbling experience. <laughs> I mean, I forgot how much hard it is, <laughs> but he's such a doll. I mean, he's the light of my life, and I always say I just need a little Everett therapy, but boy, is he willful, and he did he take after his mother. <laughs> so, okay, I, have kid, I had kids, um, and I finally get childcare settled, 
And uh, then I'm sabbatical eligible, but I can't. So Alza Corporation called me, and they wanted me to interview for a job. Now, I grew up in academia, and that was my world. And I was on the faculty, and I'm tenured. And I said, I can't do that. But I'll come for a year as a, on a sabbatical. Oh, this is a good one. I went to Condi Rice. No, that was later. So I'm on the sabbatical, and I just fell in love with it. I love the corporate world. And I was shocked to death. I mean, I had my nose in the air about the corporate world, as a lot of academics do, but I loved it. So at the end of the year, I went back, and within a month, they said, we want to offer you your, the job of the guy that I had worked for because he was promoted to a senior vice president. This was vice president and head of Alza Technology Institute. And it was a very multi-layered job in the sense that I did a lot more than research, because we did all the way through manufacturing and some different technologies. And, I, and that's where I really learned about drug delivery, formulation, et cetera, a whole other field. And I loved it. And, but when, before I went for this leave, I took a leave of absence, I went to Condi Rice. And I'd been on her steering committee and faculty senate and things like that. And I said to her, Condi, um, is it OK if I take a leave of absence for a while to go to this corporation? Because I want to understand academic industry of relationships. <laughs> oh, good. That was, I was making that up on the spot. Well, I did want us to understand it. So um, she said, OK, yes, that's a good idea. And then I said, well, how long can I stay? This is what she said. When I stood at the arms of the Soviet generals, did they ask how long? When Admiral Perry ran the Navy, did they ask how long? When George Shultz was Secretary of State, did they ask how long? I went, just wanting to go across town. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right then. So I spent four years in total, and then that they said fish or cut bait, because I was tenured. And I have a beautiful house on campus, I will say. It's right across from the Hoover House, and it's big, and my kids loved it, because they moved there when they were three and five. And that was their house. And because I moved so much as a child, I didn't want to uproot my kids. And so we, we moved into that house, and that was my golden handcuff to Stanford, because I would have had to leave it. Plus, my, my brother said, your father would turn over in his grave if you left Stanford. OK. So then um, I'm back, and I'm, in the, I'm a senior associate Dean for, Acad for Education and Student Affairs. And at that time, that job covered all medical students, all graduate students, all postdocs, the library, the lecture halls, and um, student services, which is everything from admissions to financial aid to uh, whatever else they serve. And, serve. And, and it was a really disordered system when I arrived. I don't want to impugn anybody, but first of all, student services was out on Welsh Road, and they were renowned for their rudeness when students would call for help. They would just, and then students would sometimes ask, where is the, where is the dean's office? Oh, I don't know. So I thought, that's, that's just not right. So I lobbied and got uh, student services reorganized and moved. And I also, we were in, under threat of loss of accreditation after three LCME, which is a licensing agent, uh, had reviewed the school for our shabby lecture halls and our inaccessible library. And it was, drove me crazy. So I was lobbying, and I was lobbying the students, revolt. <laughs> <laughs> and a few other things, I just, will tell you that I was not a popular person with the other deans. Uh-uh. I was very unpopular. And I was also not popular with the people that reported to me because I had, at an industry, you have an org chart. So I asked for an org chart, and I got six versions. Five of them, the person who gave it to me, they were on top. <laughs> the sixth one, was like a, a wagon wheel, and the person who gave it to me was the hub. <laughs> now you can imagine how popular I was when I reorganized. And this just did not go over that well. 
And I also asked for a consolidated budget when what the, per, the hub said, one day said to the students, well, I, could build, I think I have enough money to build you a basketball court. And I went, what? And because we were t scraping for money all the time, and it just seemed a little odd that she had these pots of money that she wasn't, you know, okay. So I, just, I gave away something there, her gender. <laughs> but anyway, uh, so what we did then is, uh, uh, you know, organize the budget and make it, because that's what I learned in, in, in the industry, and I thought, well, that's why you need to run things. So uh, after three years, the dean was removed because of the failed merger, and the new dean came in, and I was removed, of course, and it was a tough time. And I was really felt shoved in a corner. And um, he found those years at, at, uh, hard. But I will say that while I was learning to love corporate America, I came back and I started a couple of companies. I served on a public board, which was sold. And I, that, on that public board, it was through my Alza connections, on that board uh, was uh, Marty Sutter, who was the head of one of the main um, managing directors of Essex Woodlands Health Ventures, and he asked me to be an adjunct partner. And so I started doing adjunct par partner, because you know you can do 20% time, uh, uh, consulting and that kind of thing. And I also um, started to be on boards, and I'm lucky, because it's, Getting onto boards, both public and private, is a, is a great thing. It's a great way. Now I'm on three and a fourth, ask, well, several ask. But, um, you know, you get, you can work, because I'm about to retire, but you still are working hard and you're still in the middle of everything. And I really enjoy that aspect. But whew, now there's a hard to break into as a woman, except for Jerry Brown has now mandated that every board, public board has to have at least one woman. And it's being fought in the courts, of course. But then, there, later, it's gonna be two. And that is a great thing, because I think women are so much better on boards than men. Um, and I mean that. They're much more malleable, listen to people, try to work together, and men on boards, and oh, I will say venture capital, I found tougher than academia for women. It is, Nina, well, she didn't tell you that, but it is, she talked about industry, which I do think is easier, but venture capital is sort of like the pinnacle of really hard for women. And so, why am I saying all this? I have a great life, and I, I am still swimming up that stream, I can tell. The board work is hard, actually, even though I say it's great, it's hard. I've, I've got, I'm on three boards, two public, one private, and each of those boards has removed their CEO in the last six months. And that is tough, including one of them where the guy whom I liked, I'd been on that board since 2005, he had been there for 17 years, and they removed him suddenly because of personal indiscretion. And it's, and then another one, we had to fire him, and he's suing, and it is tough. So, uh, and there are many issues that are tough. But having said that, I, here I am, and I really am in the twilight of my career, but I am fortunate. When I stop whining, I realize I'm fortunate. I have had a great deal of experiences. I'm a jack of all trades, master of none. I am not. I mean, I did publish in Nature, Science, and Cell, but you know what? I never built a real body of work. And I did serve in industry, but I left. And I am on these things, but what does that really mean? Because women do beat themselves up, don't they? Um, but, you know, I've had a really interesting life. And I think one, one of my issues is that I like to be on the steep slope of a learning curve and then I kind of get bored and I jump off and go to the next one and jump off and go to the next one. And, and so I'm probably still doing that. But I will tell you, I've had a, lo a lovely life and I have two, I have a wonderful husband and two great kids. And I, so in some ways I did have it all. 
if you look at it that way. But I will say I have struggled. I have cried. I have been angry. I have kicked and screeched. I've had a supportive husband who put up with it all. And he saw how much I dreaded coming here today because I'm embarrassed. Look at all these erstwhile people. And why am I talking? And I better shut up right now. But um, I really, really do appreciate my life. And I encourage all of you. And I have tried to mentor lots of women. And I, I really encourage you to just go for that. Wherever it is that pool is up there, <laughs> keep trying. Um, and somehow you make it through, hopefully. Uh, there are some bad times. I want to tell you one more story. I was put as the head of the uh, diversity committee. When I was in England, there was a grad student, uh, Diane Lipscomb, and she's a great scientist. And we were in the same department, and then she ended up going to Yale to be with a certain scientist, and then out to Stanford. And she published extensively in Nature, et cetera. And when she was getting ready, to look for a job after her postdoc, this director of the lab said to her, well, you want to go to a you know, community college and teach because you know, you're a woman, you're, you're married. And I swear, he told her that, and I was so angry. And I went to him and I said, how dare you? How dare you? And you know what she is now? The head of an institute of neurology neurobiology at Brown University, and extraordinarily successful, and published extensively. There you go. I suppose she should have gone to a community college and teach. Nothing wrong with that, but it wasn't what she wanted. So yeah, those are some of the steps you might have to jump over. But uh, if you're young enough to be battling at that level, but you can just keep going. That's all I have to say. Oh, I wanted to thank Marsha for inviting me, all of the organizers who were so kind and patient, and all of you for listening. Thank you. Is there any questions for our, our speaker here? I have one for you. Um, you've been in academia. You've been in medicine. You've been in industry with <clears throat> being on boards. Do any of those, um, can any of those experiences where you weren't swimming upstream because you were a woman? I would say at least so in industry. I saw a lot more women successful and standing out. Um, everything else, I think medicine is a little easier, but not climbing the hierarchy. It squeezes people out. A Gordon conference, I was at a Gordon conference, and it was uh, organized by a Stanford um, colleague, and he invited 36 speakers, and one was a woman, and she didn't speak English. So I said to the chairman of that department, what's that about? And he said, you can see I'm a bit provocative. That's how come I have so many friends. Um, <laughs> and he said, well, women never ask questions. Oh. So I, from that point on, I'm like, and I get obnoxious about it, you know, because, and anyway, the person who said that to me, I, I had given, asked him a provocative question in um, Woods Hole years before, and I thought, you creep. But anyway, okay. <laughs> I, so I, I would rank it as industry is the easiest to medicine, then to academe, and then to venture. Um, but you know, it's every personal experiences. I will tell you what I love. I love about academia, and, and I love students. I have so many student friends, and they come to our house. They've gotten married at our house. They bring their babies to our house. They invite us to their wedding, and I love them. They are just like most fun, and it keeps one very young, well, I mean, younger, 
And I, I think that's one of the greatest joys of uh, academia and medicine. OK, it's time to go. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to give this to you as a Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again, Dr. Gardner, for sharing your life story and insights with us. There were a lot of funny stories in that one, and I think I just kept thinking of Dory and how we just have to keep on swimming. Um, today we have heard from several Stanford women who have broken barriers, women who have overcome obstacles and exclusion and have risen to the top of their fields. They not only achieved individual successes, but have created pathways and spaces for others to succeed. And I really want to thank you for sharing your stories with us today. Um, before we close, I also want to thank the staff of the Stanford Medicine Alumni Association for all the work that they put together um, there in the background. <laughs> I'd like to give a general thank you to the Alumni Association Board of Governors and the Stanford School of Medicine. But finally and most importantly, I want to thank all of you for spending your Saturday here with us at the farm for a day of celebration and inspiration. Rarely is it one individual who breaks a barrier on her own. Together, our collective effort, pioneering spirit, and fearless determination will continue to break barriers, move us forward, and ultimately transform the world. Before we close, please pick up your book at the registration desk. Please take a look at that Smithsonian article and continue to connect with us here at Stanford. We have the big game tailgate coming up November 23rd, and we have Alumni Day on April 18, 2020 and I hope you'll join us. Thank you for being here today.